Welcome, everybody, to the evolution of user interface development. Let me introduce you to Nick. Nick is the creator of Bell, which is a quite popular React.js user interface library, and Draft.js plugins, which is a plugin system on top of Draft.js. He now works at Serverless, where they build tooling on top of AWS Lambda and Azure functions. Let me introduce you to Max. Um, Max has a Twitter handle that I most probably can rem remember, what it's like, MXSTBR. Oh, that was right. Woo! Nice. Okay. He currently works at ThinkMill, um, where he works as an open source developer, and he takes care of Keystone.js, which is the Node CMS, as well as Elemental UI. So you can see we both have a lot to do with uh, user interface development, um, as you probably. And for my personal story, user interface development wasn't always that great. Because back in the days, like seven, eight years ago already, what you had to do is you always had to change code, then you reloaded your page, and then you had some JavaScript that executed. And you typed, for example, when you had a comment, you typed something, you click the Add button, and then you actually could see how the state of your application looks like and what it looks like if the comment was ready and confirmed. And this was kind of tedious. It's like really annoying to do this over and over again, and it was a very long feedback loop. So the first tool that really changed my life was Life Reload. Because what it did, it replaced the uh, CSS on the fly. So I could stay in a certain state of my application and just change the CSS and would reload it without changing the state of my app. And this was really, really nice because it really speeded up the way how I uh, designed and, and styled applications. The next thing that really, really impressed me was the designer, the idea of components. And React executed really, really well because what you had there is you encapsulated markup, logic, and styling, so behavior, in your component. And this is really nice because you can reuse this stuff and you reduce a lot of boilerplate, a less, way less copy-pasting, and you killed a lot of reputation. To be fair, the idea of components was even there earlier, like the idea of bug components was floating around for a long, long time, but React really executed well. It gave us the opportunity. They, they did a lot of things right. So once again, after that, my life got better with hot reloading. And the thing that happened here is that we were life reloading. You could actually um, be in a certain state of your application. You can change your code. You can change your markup. You can even change some sort of, some, to some extent, the behavior. And it works really, really well. And it just changes your interaction, your component on the fly. This is really nice, but the truth actually is that your components are not in one, don't have one particular variation or state. They actually have a lot of them, depending on your prop types, depending on your internal state. And so what I found really interesting when I read the article, when I read the article from Pure UI from Kulimar Rauk, because what he did, and that was super interesting, is he had to build a video player for WordPress. And what he did is he built himself just a little application to show this video player in all sorts of states. And you might not have th thought of it, but he had to deal with uh, situations where like, remove the DM uh, it was removed, the video was removed during the DMCA request, or a connection area appeared. Um, the playing mode, how about the progress bar? All these different things lead you to different variations of a component. So this was really, really nice, but he, did the, he went even one step further because what he did is he built himself an interface to react with the, uh, to interact with the components live on the fly on the page. So what you can see here is that he has this, oh, does it start? Yeah. So what you can see here is that when he clicks on the plus button, he can actually change the width and the height of this component. Doesn't show. Huh. Um, and this was really nice because instead of going back to your code and change something and then waiting half a second, a second or even two for hardware really going to actually recompile and, and change the component, it was super interactive and super fast. And this idea really, really stuck with me. I, I like the way of having this and because of the reduced feedback loop. So this is where the journey to a new tool um, for creating UI elements started. 
In January, I was sitting at the airport in London on my way back home to Vienna, where we're from. And Nick pings me on Skype saying, hey, Max, I've built this cool new prototype of a really cool thing. Don't you want to check it out? And I was like, well, I have an hour. Might as well. And what he showed me was this. It doesn't look very pretty, admittedly, but it's a functional version where you can um, randomize the prop types of your components. And with about 10 lines of code, this would work for all of your components. And then we started thinking, like, wow, this is actually really powerful. How, where could we take this to make this a more general tool? Where could, how could we build this properly, not in a not that pretty state? And we quickly realized that we needed to be where your components are. We basically needed to hook into the build system, right? All of your components go through a build system all the time. So if we can hook into that and get all of your components out of that, that would be very powerful. And we also didn't want to spend hours configuring things and writing sort of, you know, stuff. We just wanted to drop it into our build system and it should just work. We wanted the minimum amount of configuration possible. We both use Webpack. And Webpack is incredibly powerful and incredibly, incredibly complex. We started building a Webpack plugin. And after a week of digging through the Webpack internals and trying to get something working, we had 50 lines of horribly, horribly written code that didn't at all do what we wanted. <laughs> Quite a common story, apparently. <laughs> so I contacted Jan. Jan is a good friend of us who built the HTML Webpack plugin, which is one of the best and probably widely, widely used um, Webpack plugins available, and it's really complex. And I wrote him and said, Jan, we just tried for a week, right? We just, we did everything we could. We tried to hook into the right hooks. We tried to do the right things. Do you have any tips for us? Like, what could we do to make this happen? How can we actually do this? And Jan went, hey, wow. What you're doing actually sounds really, really interesting. I'll help you. And within two weeks, he dished out a first prototype of this Webpack plugin. And he had the brilliant idea to not make it specific to anything. He basically built a plugin system on top of Webpack's plugin system. <laughs> Now, bear, bear with me, this is actually quite good. <laughs> we built a small app to try this thing out, which is this sort of small contacts app, right? You can add contacts, you can create new, they have phone numbers, they have images, it shows your profile pictures. Um, and we realized that we had a bunch of components in there, and we, we, we wanted to try this tool. So we did, and that's how we built the application, and we're incredibly excited to announce Carte Blanche is finally released. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you haven't actually seen what it looks like, so I don't understand why anybody would clap now. <laughs> this is what it looks like. So we have our application, and we just go to a new page saying carte blanche. And what it shows us is a page that just with three lines of code gives you a list of all of your components. And you can click on each component and take a look at what your component looks like in different variations, and you can add them, and you can live edit those variations. So what we're doing here is we're looking at our contact detail um, component, right? And I'm adding a new variation, and it's going to render with some randomized data. So, you know, I thought, well, that's an interesting variation, but I don't really want to save it. I want to check out what the component behaves like with different props. So I go in and live edit it, right? I change the properties on the fly, and it immediately, immediately re-renders. And I can take a look at how does my component behave with really long names, really short names, like no avatar picture, a big avatar picture, a small avatar picture, a black avatar picture, white avatar picture. And then I can go through and click randomize, and it will randomize all the prop types based on your prop types. So we pass your prop types and flow types. And you can randomize through them and really quickly get all the different like, data that your component could get. And you can click, 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 click through until you reach an interesting variation, and then you can save it for the next developer to see. So there's a deeper purpose behind it. Obviously, you want to develop with it, and you want to fix bugs. And to do that, um, I'm going to show you how we have a contact list. And the contact list can be in a certain state, so every entry of the content list. Let's say we have an avatar, we have a first name, a last name. In a perfect world, you would have everything of that. In reality, often, the user doesn't type in the last name or the first name. Maybe you don't know the last name of that person. Uploading an avatar or finding it is actually pretty hard. So what you can see here is the contact list. And the first list is actually a perfect list where everybody has an avatar and a first name and last name. But the second list, we created an, a list which has a couple of edge cases where first name, last name, and so on is missing. And we made a mistake because we, for the fallback avatar, 
we only pick the first name, the first character of the first name. So you could see that right away because you can randomize the data and find cases that you never thought of, but also you can create these variations, which, which particular edge cases, and have them in there and find your box. And for me, this is really important because I don't want to use always my imagination to like find things that I put potentially could go wrong. I actually want to have these things in there and find them and let other tools help me to find them, like Camp Blanche. All right, obviously you want to persist this. Before you go on, now you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to lose them all the time when you go into, when you, I mean, you create these variations and you want to save them. So we actually persist them for that, for you. Um, what happens is whenever you create a variation, we create a variation file um, that matches, complete, uh, matches exactly your component path. So let me demonstrate that with a button, because here we have a button, and this button is pretty simple. Um, and be because we have this variation file created, this variation created, we also have a file for it, and it's simply JavaScript. So what we do is we save that and we sync it all the time automatically. So you can actually go in and you can change something in that file. Let's say we change from console log to alert so we actually can see something in the interface without the console or without the dev tools. So what's happening here is that we change that, we click the button, and the alert works. So it's, it works the same way as Hot Reload. We just replace the state. And this is really, really nice. Now you can clap again. <laughs> Woo! Mm -hmm. All right. And you might thought of like, how the hell does it work does, that you find avatars of first names and last names? Because if I define prop types or flow types, I usually only define string numbers and like very basic types. But what we allow you to do in the interface, we allow you to attach additional information to these, uh, to these type systems. And the real beauty of it is that you can make it with ease and we save it in a file again. So if you want to add it in a file, then you also can use the file. In this case, so we create a variation just from a raw component with simple prop type strings, nothing special. And you will see that the avatar URI, the name, the first name, these are just strings which are pretty useless. I mean, you can see an edge case already here. It probably shouldn't go over the, the second line. So this is interesting, but what we can do we provide you randomizers, and we hopefully, in the in like near future, allow you to extend and build your own randomizers. And in this case, we're selecting for the avatar an avatar randomizer. We're selecting for the first name a name with the subtype first name, for the last name, name, last name. And what you can see then is, whenever we create a new variation, is it will use these randomizers, and you actually create data that is in the scope that you have thought of. So let's create a new variation and you see first name, last name and an avatar. And we can create a second variation. And it's always, it's data that you might not, never have thought of, but still it's data that you, um, is in the scope of, of your component and actually makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> so obviously this is all very interesting and all, but I mean, can you actually use this right now? Fuck, yeah, you can. NPM install a carte blanche. <laughs> Drop it into your Webpack configuration. It's three lines of code. We're also obviously on GitHub. We're open source, right? You can, you can go to the GitHub. You can submit issues, pull requests, help us out, make this thing as good as it can be. With carte blanche, UI development suddenly is no longer meh. It's really, really, really good. And this is just the beginning. We're, there's tons of ways we, we could make this tool better. One of the biggest ones is obviously other frameworks. Right now it works for React, but imagine the same thing for, for React Native, or even, dare I say it, Angular 2 or Ember or any other component-based frameworks, right? It should also work with other build tools. Right now we integrate with Webpack because that's what we were using and we, we were comfortable with. But really this could just as well live in Browserify or Brunch or Broccoli or whatever suits your, you know? And the third big thing is integrations. 
we see ourselves building an Atom integration. Imagine being in your editor and in one pane seeing your component in different variations. And in the other pane, directly seeing the code of that component, live editing it, seeing it right next to each other, being able to get an even faster feedback loop. Or a, or a Chrome extension, right? You could make this a Chrome extension. And when you see a broken variation in your application in production, you could simply go to the Chrome extension, add a new variation that has the same data, and you could save those broken states. And the thing is, not only developers can do this, because it's a user interface, actually your designers and your marketers and you know, your boss can go in and say, hey, I found this component that doesn't quite look right when there's this and this data in it. Can you take a look at it? And you can say, right, add it to carte blanche, and I'll take a look later and fix it and hope I don't break anything else. This is really, really, really powerful, and it's hopefully going to change the way we develop user interface applications in the near future. I've got to thank a few people here, because this wouldn't have been possible without immense support from Evine and the Starter Squad team, Bill and the Stripe team, Samuel from the Reactive Content from Vacuum Labs, Chad from ThinkMill, and all of the contributors that, that, that have helped us make it, made it happen, of which a few are all sitting in the audience, but I can't see them right now. Give them all a huge round of applause. Thank you very much, Paris, for having us. Check Carte Blanche out. Have a great day. I think we're fine. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. I think we have time for a Q&A, so I mean, if you have any questions, Let us go know. ask us. Yeah. Repeat the question. So, um, what happened, so the question was if the demo was Webpack doing all the magic. So what we do is, we, since we hook into, since we're a plugin in your Webpack configuration, we use exactly your configuration. There's no sort of copy and pasting any sort of Webpack configuration. We take exactly the things you use and make them work for us. And the thing is, we can just leverage that and use your entire build system, no matter if you use CSS modules, JSS, Radium, Aphrodite, anything else, and we, it just works. Uh, if all the lightning talk speakers could come over there, that would be great. Hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, how do we determine that something is a component? The question was, how do we determine that something is a component? That's a very good question. What we do is there's a great tool called React Doctrine, which is maintained by some Facebook people. And what it does is it has these resolvers that runs all, through all of your files and checks if they're components, basically. It does that through, uh, so since we, since we hook into your build system, we get the entire source code of all of your components, and we can statically analyze it and see if there's something, A, if there's a module exported, and B, if there's any React code in there. There's a question over there, I think? It does support functional components. It does support, so the question was, does it support functional components? It does support functional components. Yeah. So the question was, how do we um, persist the variations? Well, since we write them to files, you can check them into Git, which means you can now have a library of variations of your components that your developers can look at. And then when you see, right, we need a new variation, we might need a new type or a new feature in our component. You can add a new variation, and you can add it to your version control system, no matter if it's Git or anything else. And you can sort of diff between different variations, and all of your developers will always have the same variations. Another question. So the thing is, if you change, the question was, how do, you, how do we see ourselves updating? I need to get good at this repeating question thing. <laughs> um, if, like if you change a prop type, right? How do we update it? Well, the data still works, right? So the next time you're gonna change the data or randomize it, we simply insert the, the new prop type data or you know, you can, if, if you change it from a string to a number, you can just enter a number and it's gonna work. It might throw an error for a while just because you know, that's prop types, they validate your Yeah, components. but let me add. So if you really change some properties, uh, then obviously it's not there anymore. So that's a, that's a little bit of a problem, but um, you can easily develop a component, figure out, um, most of the cases you figure out what your data is, and you most probably only add stuff. And yeah, if you rename stuff, you can simply find and replace. Um, shouldn't be too hard. Uh, could you use this one where we set up? Sure. Of course. Yeah, then let's go to the slide bit. Any, any other questions? Yeah, right there in the middle.
So the question was, how do we handle imported prop types? That's a good question, and we don't at the moment, because it's very hard to analyze. Because obviously, if you have immutable JS prop types, we can't just say, right, we'll insert immutable JS data, because we, we don't have any access to that. But well, we're going to allow you to add custom prop types and add custom controls. And we can, we'll allow you to write custom resolvers and serializers, which means you can add immutable data really easily. You just need to write it yourself if, you, if, if you're using it. Question over there? The question was, how is this different from React Storybook? And that's a good question. React Storybook is quite a nice product. We saw it when it first released, and we thought, wow, it's actually quite nice. It's a nice user interface. But I don't want to sit there for hours writing stories all day long, trying to get my components in certain states. It's really tedious. Instead, what we do is we do all of that automatically, and we do it really, really extensively. We don't care if you use anything. We just do it, and you can, you can work with it. Last question. Last question. Well, thank you.